Let me call on our second panelist now. She is Simran Sethi. She is fellow with the Institute for Food and Development Policy. She is a journalist and an educator focused on food, sustainability, and social change. She is the creator of The Slow Melt, the first podcast on the continuum of chocolate. She is the author of Bread, Wine, Chocolate, The Slow Loss of Foods We Love, and also The, slow, and also the Foods We Love in general. But thank you so much, uh, Simran. We look forward to your remarks. So you can hear from that. I, I have an affinity for chocolate. Um, I am so honored to follow in the steps of His Excellency because I recall uh, several years ago at the World Cocoa Conference in Amsterdam, that was the second World Cocoa Conference, Jean-Marc Anga, the executive director, sat on a panel with major manufacturers, chocolate manufacturers, and it was, he showed a slide of the portion of revenue that went to cocoa farmers um, from a dollar spent on a, a chocolate bar. That portion is roughly six cents for every dollar that we spend on a bar. And he turned to the manufacturers and he said, you know, he was really in a very open-ended way asking, what will you do? How will you make this more just? And the response was disappointing to be honest. The response was, well, these farmers must diversify. There was no accountability and there was no responsibility. And um, this is something that I feel very strongly about, that this needs to change. My comments are directed toward the book, and it's such an honor to be here and to be able to talk about this book. Uh, but, but I want to say what His Excellency was saying, which is what this requires is a system change, is vital. So um, I hope that's something that, again, we'll revisit in our comments. My job uh, is a journalist, and uh, I remain an invested outsider. I'm not, um, I have, the quality of expertise on this panel is extraordinary. I'm, I'm humbled to be here. But I, I would like to raise some questions today, and I would like to say I really believe in Cocobod and its positioning um, to be a world leader and to help lead this transformation in Coco. So, um, so the question to ask, I think, is how can the board empower producers and transform the industry so farmers are not so vulnerable to these market fluctuations and that cocoa remittances can continue to be a steady source of foreign exchange? In, in the last, uh, since uh, 2016, right around Valentine's Day, we've seen the price of cocoa plummet by about 30%, the commodity price of cocoa. Now, we're talking about farmers who earn roughly two U.S. dollars per day, I think, in Ghana, and around one dollar per day in Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire is the, the largest global producer of cocoa, and, and Ghana is, is just behind um, at this moment. You know, at one point it was reversed. And, um, and the vulnerability there is extraordinary. So what needs to happen in order to change this dynamic? This image that you're seeing on the cover of the book reveals so much and so little about the kind of effort that goes into transforming this product. I am humbled by the amount of effort it takes to grow a cocoa pod, to harvest the pod, to ferment the pod, dry the pod, ship the pod. These are smallholder farmers producing very small amounts of cocoa and very vulnerable to these fluctuations, oftentimes not even realizing how vulnerable they are because they're not getting the layers of information they should about, about global pricing. So that brings us back to what Shashi said about transparency. Um, I'm going all over the place here. I had written a 20-minute speech, by the way. <laughs> Just so you know, I have plenty to say. Um, but, you know, the predicted end of subsidies of the prices that Cocoa Bod has paid to around 800,000 farmers is estimated to cost about $450 million in this season alone. And so the question becomes, how can CocoBot afford to do what it's doing and continue to support farmers and realistically deal with these plummeting prices? There is, of course, the push toward working with the private sector, and I think there are very appropriate ways for this to happen. I'm not an economist. Um, from the outsider, again, perspective, I think there's, there is great opportunity here. But this also requires a certain amount of creativity and I think a certain amount of agency in returning some of this power back to producing countries. This decoupling, so creating this kind of low, uh, low value, not low quality, low value input, and then turning it into this higher priced uh, good elsewhere, typically in, in Europe and, and in North America, um, needs to come together 
we need to increase local consumption of cocoa and cocoa byproducts, increase value added products. There's some great things happening now in Accra with 57 chocolate is one example. We were tasting divine chocolate here earlier. It would be great for all of this work, as His Excellency was saying, to come back into the country of origin. Now, of course, there have been some barriers around this in the past, and manufacturers will tell you there's problems with shipping, there's problems with refrigeration. You know, this is chocolate is a product that melts. That's why I called my podcast the slow melt. Um, but I think now we're seeing greater, greater opportunity here to really uh, reconsider this. And to, um, to, in order to do this, I think we need to do two things. We need to educate the local market. This isn't, uh, there's not a culinary history of cocoa consumption within Ghana. So that's something that really needs to be developed. Um, and that, that is something that uh, you know, can be manifested in a number of ways. It doesn't need to be the sweet confection that we end up eating here. It can look very different within that country. So there's a lot of creativity and opportunity there to also talk about the health benefits of this product and to ultimately say, this belongs to us. Um, this idea that the farmers who are growing this are considered a bit low status, that they are aging farmers, and that the hopes that they have for their children is to actually get out of cocoa farming is something else that must be transformed. I'm a journalist, so I talk a lot about narrative and story. So this story needs to change, right? The way that we view this product from its inception all the way, this, this beautiful input all the way to the end product must be transformed. Cocobod, I think, has a great opportunity to be a leader in changing this conversation globally because anything that happens in Ghana will transform this market. Now, some of the other things, oh, I'm at minus seven, that have been discussed are, well, grow more, grow more. We are currently in an oversupply. I am not sure if this increased production is, is the route to increasing wages and increasing justice for farmers. And then the second idea is specialization, right? We've got this wonderful product. Ghanaian cocoa is a baseline for what everyone tastes when they're doing sensory analysis of cocoa. That is the taste of chocolate. But specialization makes up about 1% of the market. So there's still room for creativity, and there's still room to see how we can chart a new course. Now, what that looks like is kind of up to all of us, but I think it also involves sharing some of this information not only with farmers, but with consumers. There has never been a time where consumers have a greater opportunity to participate in this conversation and to share their concerns with large-scale manufacturers and to share their concerns, frankly, with anybody on Twitter. You know? so, so we have this opportunity to really reframe the narrative. And, and if we don't do that, if the key players do not do that, someone else will do that for them. So I hope that this will be a turning point and an opportunity to really make these shifts. Thank you. Simran, thank you so much. Um, that was a passionate call for changing the narrative, the story, and I hope that we are all part of that change together.